Hi, everyone, and welcome to the RightsCast. I'm Nancy Leong, and my guest today is Margot Kaplan, who is a professor of law at the Rutgers School of Law, where she teaches health law and policy, criminal law, and a seminar on sex crimes. She also holds a joint appointment with the Department of Public Policy and Administration. Margot, thank you so much for joining me today to talk about your work. Thanks for having me. So I am really excited to talk about your article, Sex Positive Law, which came out in the New York University Law Review last year in 2014. It's a fascinating piece. And let's just start with the basics. What do you mean when you talk about sex positive law? Sex positive law has this premise that sexual pleasure is a valuable source of happiness just in and of itself. And there isn't any one definition of sex positivity, but there are a few guiding principles. For example, the idea of sex positivity rejects the idea that sex is and sexual pleasure are, are shameful. It values all forms of consensual sexual activity as sources of pleasure and fulfillment. And it isn't it rejects a sort of heteronormative idea of uh, privileging male or heterosexual desire and pleasure above female or queer desire and pleasure. So it, it sort of respects uh, diverse ways of expressing and experiencing sexuality. So the idea that sexual pleasure in and of itself is valuable is supported by a lot of work of moral philosophers and it's also supported by human experience. People just tend generally tend to value the pleasure that they experience. You know, you have people who are Jets fans who will line up in the cold and tailgate. Uh, you have people who will line up to see movies that they love or, or pay a lot of money to see concerts that they enjoy. Um, people can't empirically demonstrate the value of this, but they know that they feel it and other people may fail to find the same experience as pleasurable, but some people do and they value that. And similarly, sexual pleasure is valuable simply because it's pleasurable. And I argue that contrary to this common sense notion, a lot of areas of law really central to how we experience sex and sexual pleasure really assume just the opposite, that sexual pleasure in itself has negligible or negative value, and we sacrifice really nothing of importance when our laws uh, curtail it or circumscribe it. So I argue that if we want to question and reject this unfounded assumption, we need to reconceptualize several areas of the law. And in particular, my work focuses on First Amendment law, particularly obscenity law. I look at criminal law when it comes to the criminalization of uh, sadomasochistic sexual activity, BDSM, constitutional freedom. Um, it's important to note, though, that when I talk about reconceptualizing the law and when I talk about sex positivity, I'm not saying that just because we value sexual pleasure, we need to value it above everything else. That would be ridiculous. It's not the most valuable thing. And a lot of good reasons exist to limit activities that might bring pleasure to some people. So just because I really enjoy art and get pleasure from viewing a Picasso doesn't mean I get to steal a Picasso from a museum just to further that pleasure. Or I don't get to kidnap a painter and force a painter to paint me something just because I really like art. So it doesn't mean we value sexual pleasure above everything else. Um, what it means, though, is that we do value sexual autonomy, including valuing people's ability to say no when they don't want to have sex or really define the circumstances under which they want to have sex. So sex positivity is about valuing positive, pleasurable sexual experiences for all parties involved. How is current law not sex positive? Or how is current law sex negative? I know in the article you talk about criminal law and First Amendment law. Can you give us some specific examples? Obscenity law provides a really good example because it's something that's been around for a while. I think people often don't see this sort of inherent assumption in it. But let's look at how we define obscenity. So Miller v. California, that's the test in which we define obscenity, and it defines it as uh, having uh, three, uh, three characteristics. One is that it has to appeal to the prurient interests. The second is that it depicts sexual conduct in a patently offensive way. And third is that it lacks what's called serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value, also known as slaps value. Now, this material, this obscenity, anything that falls within those three uh, characteristics, lacks any constitutional protection. So unlike other forms of speech, you don't need to show any particular harm for a state to ban obscenity. You only have to show that it fits into this definition. It has no constitutional protection. So because of this, offensive material in general retains constitutional protection unless the offensiveness is paired with this really specific purpose to sexually gratify or arouse. So if uh, offensive speech with the purpose to sexually gratify or arouse, something that's sexually explicit, supposedly appeals to this prurient interest, it's allowed to contain, uh, maintain constitutional protection only if it contains some form of this slaps value. 
Now, implicit in this standard is that there's insufficient value in sexual pleasure alone to merit constitutional protection. And to receive constitutional protection, it needs to be sort of redeemed by some other uh, slapped value. For every other type of material in the law, uh, the state can't ban it unless there's some sort of harm or fraud. You can't ban something just for being offensive. The exception to this is obscenity law, so unless it's prurient speech. And then we have this special category that we've just designated as outside the First Amendment. And when it comes to so-called sexual or prurient speech, uh, the state gets to ban this material when it's offensive unless it has this other redeeming value. So other material presumptively protected and the state has to show harm or risk. Prurient speech presumptively not protected when it's sexually explicit and offensive unless it has some sort of redeeming slaps value. I argue that really the most convincing argument for this distinction isn't that obscenity is different in its, in its uh, how it appeals to our senses or how it offends us or the harm involved, but really the distinction here is that the purpose of obscenity is to sexually gratify. This is what it defines it, and this is what subjects it to sort of this special status outside the Constitution. Because of this, you can see this in the Supreme Court's decision. It's rejected efforts to regulate other types of speech, so violent speech. The court has said you can't do that. You can't regulate it the same way you regulate obscenity because it's just violent, because it's not merely sexual. So the court really uses sex to define obscenity. Now, if we recognized that sexual pleasure had some value in and of itself, if we recognize that, uh, then it makes no sense, really, to designate offensive prurient material as outside the ambit of the Constitution and, and nothing else. It's not less worthy of protection, let's say, violent speech or racist speech. So because of that, if we are actually to look at valuing sexual pleasure, we have to rethink how we categorize uh, certain areas of speech for First Amendment protection and what we choose to protect and what we choose not to protect. The thing about the Miller test that has always struck me as really strange is that in order for the government to establish that speech is obscene and therefore unprotected, it needs to establish, first of all, that it, that it as you've said, appeals to the prurient interest, which means that somebody has to be turned on by it or somebody has to think that it's sexy. But then at the same time, on the second prong of the Miller test, the speech also has to be patently offensive. And I think that the relationship between these two prongs really speaks to how we value sexual pleasure, or perhaps more accurately, how we tend not to value sexual pleasure. So this idea that something could both appeal to the prurient interest, that is, it might be sexy, or somebody might be turned on to it, and at the same time, it's patently offensive, and that that tension doesn't require any further explanation, that strikes me as a very sex negative idea. It is sex negative, sort of saying there's a right way to be aroused and a wrong way to be aroused. Um, now, we might find that there are certain sexually arousing things that we have good reason to, uh, to limit with the law, but to just create the sort of category of uh, material that is just outside the ambit of the First Amendment without having to show any sort of harm doesn't really make sense unless you just simply say we don't have to worry about constitutional protection for speech that's just simply sexual and simply meant to arouse. I think you're right that there is an unacknowledged subjectivity to these judgments that are being made. That some judge somewhere could determine whether something appeals to the prurient interest and is offensive in doing so and has no serious scientific, literary, artistic, or political value. I think that that's a subjective determination. People joke about Justice Potter Stewart's use of the phrase, I know it when I see it, when he was discussing his threshold test for obscenity in his con concurrence to the Supreme Court's 1964 decision in Jacobellas versus Ohio. People joke about that line, and it's really one of the most well-known lines written by a justice in the history of the Supreme Court. And of course, all of this took place before the Miller decision, which was handed down in 1973. But I think that Justice Stewart's formulation is actually lurking there in the Miller test, this idea that justices do know it when they see it. And so perhaps in his concurrence in Jacobellis, uh, Justice Stewart was really just being more candid than judges normally are, or people generally normally are when they think about their ideas about obscenity and what makes something offensive or uh, not offensive. So let's talk a little bit about where all of this sex negativity is coming from. Do you think it's something in our history? 
Do you think it's something else in our culture? We hear these complaints all the time about how sexualized society at large and more specifically popular culture has become in recent years. But at the same time, I was very persuaded by your claim that the law is extremely sex negative in a whole lot of different areas. And so I'm interested in your thoughts on why the sexualization of culture as a whole hasn't spread to the law, or at least hasn't spread to the law in a sex positive way. In as a society in general, we have not had a sex positive history. In general, sexuality for much of history was something to be contained and feared. And it could have significant negative repercussions. At the same time, sexuality is something that people have valued, indulged in, and loved very much throughout history. So we don't have a, a simple puritanical history. We have a push and pull between the different ways that we like to approach our sexuality and view it. Our laws in general, though, have tended to be um, put in place in a way that is more controlling of our sexuality. And in general, the idea of sexual pleasure in and of itself is not something that has been valued uh, within our society, I would say, from a religious standpoint. Most Judeo-Christian culture doesn't really value, uh, or history doesn't really value sexual pleasure engaged in for its own sake. Um, usually sexual pleasure is tied to something that is considered more important or more uh, justifying, such as the creation of a family or the strengthening of a marriage. So the idea of something like obscenity, like um, uh, so-called marital aids is what they used to be called, or sex toys, all these different things. And the law, the way they got their legitimacy, is through tying them to things that we value much more. Now, in part, is because these other things are very well established. We have stronger constitutional protections for, the, uh, for our reproductive rights, um, and we have stronger constitutional protections for our privacy. But at the same time, it's amazing if you look at a lot of our... Uh, a lot of our uh, judicial history, including Lawrence v. Texas, if you look at the text of Lawrence v. Texas, the court, every time it provides something that, uh, that embraces sexual freedom, it's very careful not to talk about sexual freedom in and of itself and to say, no, no, this is not really about sexual freedom. This is about something greater, more important. So our courts have been very, very careful to really tie any embrace of sexuality to something that is more legitimate uh, historically, such as marriage, and more recently uh, in Lawrence v. Texas, this idea of intimate relationships, um, even if they're non-marital. So uh, whether it's the right to access birth control being tied to the idea of, well, you get to decide whether or not to start a family, um, or you have marital privacy, or when it comes to uh, constitutional prohibitions on sodomy laws, then it's the idea of these enduring intimate relationships and this very, very personal identity expression. In these situations, it's never really just about sex because in general, the law has not really valued that. You know, I think that's a very interesting observation. And I think it's interesting to think about whether Lawrence versus Texas might have either come out differently or been written in a very different way if the facts had been framed and presented to the court all the way up and to Justice Kennedy as being about two men who got together for a night of fun, not two men who were in a committed relationship with one another, which might have been what it was. In fact, one of them was in a committed relationship with someone else. So it's interesting how the court sort of goes out of its way to present this as something that it's not. And what's interesting is that if you look at Bowers v. Hardwick, what uh, the Supreme Court overturned in Lawrence, that's essentially how they decide to look at it. Uh, they decide to look at it as just sort of a, a sex act engaged in for its own sake and own pleasure. And Lawrence v. Texas pulls away from this. In reframing this as solely related to intimacy, it limits our view of the full expression of sexuality that could be involved in, in uh, what it protects. And it's very limiting that way and, and, and probably very misleading. In reading your article and hearing you talk about this, it's very clear that sex positive law and sex negative law are two very different things. In your view, what are some of the harms of sex negative law, both to the legal system specifically and perhaps more generally to society as a whole? Our laws, they balance different competing rights and values. And when we don't honestly acknowledge the value of sexual pleasure, we make bad laws and, and we make dishonest laws. We make laws that allow us to take mental shortcuts that we shouldn't take. 
So obscenity law is a good example. Obscenity law is an area of law where we aren't being honest about the choices that we're making regulating speech. We're designating this area of obscenity as non-speech and uniquely undeserving of protection when there's really no reason that it should be uniquely undeserving of protection. Um, and we're doing it because we think sexual pleasure for its own sake is uniquely without value or even negative value, and that's an incorrect premise. So if we're honest that this isn't true, then we have to really sit down and rethink First Amendment law as a whole. We can't take the mental shortcut about obscenity law. We have to rethink what we regulate and why we regulate it. So one option is that we could say, okay, well, just no more obscenity law. We subject what is now obscenity to the same standard everything else. That is, you have to subject it to strict scrutiny or there has to be some sort of imminent harm. Another option is that if we think that there are good reasons why we're regulating some uh, offensive sexual material, then what we have to do is you have to sit down and sort of think about whether or not we want to designate certain areas of speech as um, worthy of less constitutional protection or have a different standard for that. And we need to think about what those areas are going to be and why. So we can't presume anymore that we have just this category of inherently sort of arousing speech that's, that's uh, worth less and that gets less protection. We have to have a more honest discussion about what states should be able to curtail. Maybe we want to look at um, violent speech in a different way. Maybe we want to look at speech that um, is racist or objectifies people. Or maybe we want to say, that's very dangerous. We don't want to go down that road. But we have to have a more honest discussion about the type of speech that we're regulating and really think things through more. So that, that's one of the legal harms of sex negative law is that it simply allows us to make laws that are based on bad presumptions and therefore are not good laws. Um, as far as society goes, having sex negative law also allows us to sort of take a mental shortcut. It allows us to have this sort of two, frame of, two frames of mind, I suppose you could say, where we really do value sexual pleasure and you hear a lot about how sex is um, a obsession in our society. But at the same time, we have this need to uh, tightly control it and make it very shameful. Um, you know, some people would argue that making it shameful is what makes it so gratifying for some people that they like the shamefulness. But at the same time, the shamefulness in sex has led to a lot of questionable and deeply misogynistic laws, a lot of laws that are very unfriendly to sexual minorities. Um, so making law sex negative really perpetuates this. And making law sex positive can help educate and reform in ways that is more realistic about the ways that we actually experience sex and sexuality. Do you think there are any laws right now that are sex positive? Not just sex neutral, but actually sex positive. Can you give us any examples of that? We're seeing a retreat from sex negative laws. So every time there's a retreat of sex negative laws, there's sort of a move towards sex positivity. So we're seeing that when it comes to reproductive rights with queer sexuality. I think that if you look at um, the justifications we use, they don't tend to be sex positive, such as in Lawrence v. Texas, but in reality, they do have a sex positive effect in some ways. Um, but if you wanted to go for something that is um, really purely sex positive, I, I think a good example is comprehensive sexuality education. So comprehensive sexuality education, uh, which is not the rule in most states at all, it's usually abstinence-only education. Comprehensive sexuality education gives people the, the tools and knowledge they need to exercise their sexuality and their sexual autonomy. It tells people not to abuse or exploit other people sexually, which is a very sex-positive method. method. Comparing that to abstinence-only education, which is the norm in most states and communities, which talks about sex only in service to marriage and reproduction, and it emphasizes and often really distorts the shame and dangers in associate, that are associated with sex. Another potential sex-positive law would be laws that protect sexual autonomy. So in some ways, rape law can be sex-positive because it protects people's sexual autonomy, their ability to decide how, with whom, they want to have sex. Now, rape law is better than it once was, but it still has significant shortcomings. So in some ways, it's sex-positive, in other ways, not so much. So we have this new law in California that has changed the way that sexual assault is being evaluated on campuses. It's now evaluated according to an affirmative consent standard. And it's also my understanding that similar legislation is pending in New Jersey and a few other jurisdictions as well. And so I'm interested in your thoughts about affirmative consent and the law. Is this something that we would want to incorporate into sexual assault law as it applies to college campuses? Is it something that we would want to incorporate into sexual assault law more generally? Is it something that we would want to incorporate more broadly into the law, not just sexual assault law, but uh, the law in general? Affirmative consent as a concept 
is, is very sex positive. It, it reframes the discussion. Essentially, consent in the law right now, when it isn't affirmative consent, implies that you're entitled to someone else's body unless they protest or unless they are incapable of protest. So you have someone that says no, the idea that no means no, or you have someone who's incapacitated to the point that they can't say no. And that's the majority uh, of states tend to look at that form of consent. Affirmative consent is different. Affirmative consent says you're not entitled to have sex with other people. It's not their responsibility to ward you off if they don't want to. It's your responsibility to take reasonable steps to ensure that you are on the same page with the person you're having sex with. And so affirmative consent is very sex positive because it values sexual pleasure, it values sexual autonomy and agency. The concept is centered around a mutual desire to have sex and it encourages communication. It encourages desire and mutually fulfilling sexual relationships and it values both parties' desires. Now the cons of it and incorporating it into the law is that its parameters are, are not clear. Now granted, the parameters of consent have never been clear in the law. We've spent the last few decades, when we actually start caring about the concept of consent more, uh, we've spent the last few decades debating the parameters of consent in the law. So just because we debate it and don't understand exactly how we want to phrase it doesn't mean we need to throw out the entire concept of consent or affirmative consent. It just means it's not easy to determine what to criminalize and how to draft a good law. So the issues that we have to deal with is what makes consent not affirmative? What type of reasons for saying yes to sex are the reasons that we want the law to say are legitimate? So for example, um, Jezebel.com just uh, ran this interesting article about the idea of maintenance sex, which is uh, the sex that people have in relationships when they want to make the other partner happy or just continue having sex a certain you know, quantity of times per week or something like that, but they themselves may not really be all that interested in having sex. And the term for this supposedly is, is maintenance sex. And now, it's easy to look at someone's consent to sex with a gun to their head as clearly not the kind of consent that the law wants. And when we get into sort of a lesser form of coercion, we can also see that there are a lot of areas in which we think that sex is so coerced that it's not affirmative consent. But we also have to look at situations like maintenance sex. Is that affirmative consent? When someone is asking you to have sex, you're not really in the mood, but you do it to make them happy. At what point does that become coercive, and at what point is that a normal part of a healthy functioning relationship? So a lot of these um, areas are things that affirmative consent has to contend with. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing. These are discussions that we need to have. Uh, we just need to make sure that we're coming out on the right side of it when we draft these laws, or that we come out with something that doesn't that criminalizes what we want to criminalize and that doesn't criminalize what we want, don't want to criminalize. On the one hand, we would want people ideally to consent enthusiastically to every sexual encounter they ever have. And even more so, we would want them to feel enthusiastic about every sexual encounter they've ever had. That's the way that things would work in the perfect world. In the real world, I think that things are often more messy. So in the real world, we have scenarios like maintenance sex, which you've just discussed. In the real world, we might have a scenario where, just to make the example a little bit concrete, let's, th let's say that we have two people who have decided to go home together and have consensual sex, a man and a woman. So they go home together, they have consensual sex, they end up spending the night together, and in the morning, one person, will say the woman, decides that she's going to wake the man up by performing oral sex on him. There's no pre-existing agreement between the two of them about this type of activity. They've never discussed it. Maybe they don't even know each other that well. The man was asleep at the time that she began performing oral sex, so there was no opportunity for him to consent in the moment. So there's no agreement here about this type of sexual activity. And so to me, this doesn't sound like a situation in which one person has obtained affirmative consent from the other person prior to beginning this particular type of sexual activity. At the same time, I think that many people, not everybody, but many people would classify this particular scenario as one that is harmless or at a minimum is not something that we would want to classify as sexual assault. If we rephrase that question, right, and said she wakes him up um, by inserting something to his rectum, a sex toy. A lot of people would say, wait, no, you cannot do that. That's absolutely not consented to. So um, it's not really just sort of, you know, someone who's had sex before is automatically consented to a sexual act, because a lot of people, I think, 
also believe that uh, most, a lot of sexual acts are not necessarily consented to automatically. Affirmative consent has to navigate those waters. It's, it's difficult to do. Yeah, and I think you're making a good point, which is that what people think about affirmative consent in a particular situation depends at least to some degree on what they think of the underlying sexual behavior, whether or not they're willing to admit it even to themselves. It's going to be extremely context specific. Um, for some people, being woken up to with oral sex, actually a lot of people may not really want that, um, in part because maybe they regret the sex they had the night before. And so they wake up with a person and the person's performing a sexual act on them and they would really have preferred this person leave their house and not be performing a sexual act on them. Affirmative consent puts the responsibility on people to make sure the other person's consenting. Um, that's just a good rule of thumb in general that you not sort of surprise someone on the off chance that they might like it. Uh, the question is not whether or not that's appropriate behavior, but whether or not it's criminalizable behavior. And I think that's where the law becomes a, it gets very difficult. I also wanted to ask you your thoughts about an article I was reading recently by Elizabeth Emmons, who's a professor at Columbia Law School. The article is called Compulsory Sexuality. It came out about six months ago in the Stanford Law Review, and it's about asexual people. It discusses the way that asexual people are treated under the current legal system. And it also looks at the ways in which law currently harms asexual people, in particular people who are what are known as repulsed asexuals. So a repulsed asexual is someone who is not only indifferent to sex, but who is affirmatively disgusted by sexual activity or really by any mention of sexuality. What do you think sex positive law has to say about the legal situation of asexual people. Do you think that sex positive law is at odds with the interests of asexual people? Or do you think that uh, somewhat paradoxically sex positive law might actually be protective of the interests of uh, asexual people in some ways? What are your thoughts about that? In general, I don't think that sex positive law is at all harmful. In fact, I think it can encompass a lot of the interests of asexual people because sex positive law is about sexual agency and respecting different sexual choices. And people who are asexual, they have, they are in some ways sort of, you could consider them very much a sexual minority. And sex positive law should respect that um, and should respect the fact that people experience sexuality in different ways, including a lack of sexuality or a lack of sexual desire or a lack of desire to engage in sexual activity. It's also important to remember too that Again, sex positive law doesn't value sex above all else. So laws that value artistic expression don't mean that people who have no interest in art are harmed. Now, if you are going to perceive sex asexuality as sort of this disgust with sexuality, then that interest, I think, yes, yeah, sex positive law is not really compatible with that because it, it doesn't accept disgust in sexuality. But I have no problem with it. I don't think that's what the majority of people who are asexual are asking for in the law. I'm asking that the law be asexual itself, they're just asking for a place in the law and sex positivity has a place in the law for sexual minorities. My understanding is that building on this really fascinating research that you've undertaken in the sex positive law piece, you're now looking at how other areas of the law, in addition to criminal law, can be used to address some of the harms that are associated with rape. I'd love to hear more about where you're going with this. The next piece I'm working on well, to go back a little, the sex positive law piece discussed rape law a little bit, and I had a longer section, but I realized it needed more time and effort devoted to it. And the next piece that I'm working on um, argues that if we're really going to have a sex positive approach to rape in general in the law, that we can't simply focus on criminal law. In fact, criminal law um, is necessary, but, but completely insufficient. Um, in the same way that it's a completely necessary and completely insufficient way to address domestic violence. And what we should be looking at instead as perhaps a, a very primary focus is a very, um, a very thorough and focused public health and public education message. And there are a lot of reasons for this. And one is that what we're trying to do here, and the idea of sex positive uh, law and sex positivity in general, can't just focus on prohibition. When trying to end rape, what you're trying to do is to get people to change their sexual behaviors. In general, criminal law has always been a very poor tool for changing sexual behaviors and sexual norms in society. And when it comes to rape, we have more of a problem than 
a sort of malicious rapist jumping out of the woods. What we have is a problem in how people view each other sexually and how they view access to each other's bodies. And what we have is what people have termed sort of a rape culture. And if you want to change the culture and change how people interact with each other, criminal law alone is simply not going to do that. In fact, it's usually a very poor tool for that. Public health campaigns and education campaigns, while not always completely successful, in fact, never completely successful, are much better tools for that. So for example, when we wanted to get people to start wearing condoms, criminalizing lack of condoms would have been a really poor choice to accomplish this. But public health and education campaigns are a better choice for accomplishing this. So if we have better public education and public health campaigns that deal with affirmative consent and that deal with how we view each other's bodies and what is appropriate and inappropriate sexual behavior towards people, that I think is going to go a, a much longer way than simple criminal prohibitions in helping us curtail the real problem of rape, which is the idea that people seem to still have this feeling that they're entitled to access to other people's bodies unless they're fought off or unless there is sort of clear, violent non-consent. One of the reasons that this is a sex-positive approach is that it is not just an approach that focuses on what you should not be doing, but it's an approach that values good sexual relationships. And at the moment, the law and policy that we have doesn't really focus on what good sexual relationships are. They don't focus on what we should be striving for. Instead, they just focus on prohibitions. And in doing so, they don't tend to provide um, the kind of guidance you need in order to change culture. And that's something you can only really, really do with public health uh, campaigns and public education campaigns, not really with criminal law. It's not, this is not to say that there should be no criminal law of rape. There should absolutely be criminal law of rape. And I also believe that rape law needs significant reform. But we're never going to get to where we want to go by just focusing on that. And the way that our legal theory and our laws have been focusing simply on criminal law and debating what consent should mean when we're outlawing something is a very short-sighted approach. Well, Margo, thank you so much for joining me today and for talking about your work on sex positive law. This has been a really interesting discussion. Thanks very much for having me, Nancy. I really enjoyed it. And for those of you who are interested in knowing more about Margo or about Margo's other work or about some of the topics that we've been discussing today, take a look at the links below the video and that should provide you with some additional information. Thanks again for watching the RightsCast and I will see you next week.